This is week five of financial markets. I'm here in Berkeley College, one of the 12 residential colleges here at Yale, with some of my students <laughs> from my class. Uh, our, this college was named after George Barclay, the philosopher, same as the city of Berkeley, California, and, and no one can tell me why we don't pronounce his name right anymore. This week, we will start with derivatives, futures, forwards, and options. Uh, I'll we'll also have a, a more philosophical note that relates to derivatives at the end of this week with uh, Andrew Redleaf. So, uh, what are derivatives? They are something that derives a, a security a market, a derivatives market, is a market for securities that derive their prices from other prices. So we have, for example, futures markets and forward markets, which are markets for future delivery of some commodity or financial instrument. And so it has another dimension. The derivative price is derived from the spot price of the underlying. The, if it's oil, the spot price is the price of a, boil, a barrel of oil today, and the futures price is the price of a barrel of oil delivered at some point in the future. So it seems to me, and I find derivatives markets fascinating, and so do other people, because it represents a kind of high, higher technology. At the same time, because they represent a more conceptually difficult financial structure, they are they lead people to sometimes make mistakes and errors. In particular, part of the financial crisis that we've observed since 2008, part of it is due to errors people made with using derivatives. Uh, Warren Buffett. The, uh, one of the most successful investors in the country, has called uh, derivatives weapons of mass destruction. I think he was thinking about uh, analogy to nuclear weapons, which as long as they're kept carefully guarded, nothing is going to happen, we hope. But there could be a horrible mistake where one of them is set off by mistake. So in that sense, he thought they were weapons of mass destruction. Personally, I think that uh, there is always a risk with new and more advanced technology. Uh, but our society moves ahead with the technology anyway. James Watt, who invented the steam engine in the late 1700s, resisted the use of high-pressure steam because he thought it was too dangerous. The boilers could explode. But now, we, in, in modern society, we use steam engines, or in the form of the uh, steam turbine invented by Charles Parsons, as, a, as the most important way of generating electricity. And that's very high pressure steam. So I think Watt was right for his day. There was a danger. But as technology advances, we get better and better. And we have more protection. And we have government regula safety regulations that eventually make technology useful. So th that's how that's how I view uh, uh, that's how I view derivatives. Yes, they might have had a role. I, they did have a role in the financial crisis, but these are things we can learn from. I think that it's important for people who have to have basic knowledge of finance to know something about how these derivatives work. Uh, so this lecture is rather more mathematical than uh, some other lectures here. Uh, because the theory is mathematical. I'm going to talk about some really advanced theories, at least briefly in this, uh, in this week, of uh, well, the fair value formula for futures markets, the binomial option pricing formula for options markets, and the Black-Scholes formula for options markets. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of the mathematics, but I want to I think that someone should know at least the basic idea of, of these uh, concepts. Now, the, uh, the models are not that I'm going to show in this week are 
beginnings, they're foundational models, and they're not necessarily completely the last story. And you'll, you can find a huge mathematical literature. I mean, you can get a PhD on derivatives pricing. It's a complicated phenomenon. But I, I should say that you do have to take these things with a grain of salt. One thing that they neglect is the so-called black swan or outlier problems uh, that uh, like, um, what, why do they call it? A black swan. If you've seen swans all your life, they've always been white. And so you might conclude in your mind that black swans don't exist. So you, you could make a bet that there is no black swan. <laughs> Someday you'll see one because they really do exist. And finance is like that. It creates problems of rare big events. This comes up uh, with our outside lecturer today, uh, this week, Andrew Redleaf, who, who talks about this problem. Redleaf is a founder of White Box Partners, uh, which he created in two th the year 2000 and now has many billions of uh, dollars under management. Uh, he's also the author, uh, with Richard Vigilante, of the 2010 book, Panic, the Betrayal of Capitalism by Wall Street and Washington. Uh, I'm not going to get into that book, but I'm going to, you, you'll see from his talk about how he, as a financial manager, has to worry about not only the derivatives of formulas that we are presenting, but also about th these big, rare events that, m that happen infrequently and are killer events when they happen. So Redleaf will, I think, uh, at the end of this week, serve as both an inspiration. Uh, he doesn't believe in efficient markets, as neither do I, <laughs> not as the final truth. And he's been successful in betting against efficient markets theory. But he's also cautionary. Uh, and he uh, conveys to you some of the deep worries that someone in his role of life has to manage.